So everyone, in today's video, we're going to talk all about the key anatomy of the wrist extensors. We're going to talk about how they present anatomically, and we're going to talk about different clinical features such as tennis elbow, lateral epicondylitis, and different nerve conditions that impact on these muscles as well. So if you're ready to learn, let's dive in. Hey everyone, Khaled here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So in today's video, we're looking at the clinical anatomy of the wrist extensors and why they matter so much in our clinical practice. So just to start off, we're going to be talking about these key muscles that you can see on the screen, including extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi ulnaris, extensor digitorum, extensor digiti minimi, and then a couple of smaller muscles closer to the wrist, which are extensor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, and extensor indices. So let's start off with one of the biggest of the group, which is the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle. So this muscle originates from the anterolateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus, a ridge, as we can see, just proximal to the lateral epicondyle here, and it's the more anterior surface of this ridge that the muscle originates from. The muscle then runs down the radius posteriorly to insert into the base of the second metacarpal. So that is our extensor carpi radialis longus muscle, and the key actions of this muscle are wrist extension, and radial deviation. Next, we're going to talk about extensor carpi radialis brevis. This muscle is the first that we're going to look at that really originates from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. You're going to see a lot of muscles originating from this very landmark, which is this clear bony protrusion that we have on the lateral side of the humerus at the elbow joint, synonymous with tennis elbow as we will come to later. This muscle then also runs down the posterior aspect of the radius and inserts into the base of the third metacarpal. We said extensor carpi radialis longus was the second, this one is the third. And the key action of this muscle, like its counterpart, extensor carpi radialis longus, is to extend the wrist and to assist in radial deviation as well. Then we have extensor carpi ulnaris. This muscle also originates from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, but also has an attachment to the posterior border of the ulna, as we can see just here. It then runs down the posterior aspect of the ulna, as the term extensor carpi ulnaris might suggest, and it inserts into the base of the fifth metacarpal. And we can see from this view that it attaches a little bit more medially on the fifth metacarpal. And the key action of this muscle is to act as a wrist extensor, but also as an ulna deviator. So we've just gone through the key carpi muscles, as I like to call them, because we have extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, and extensor carpi ulnaris, as you can see here. Now, the key thing that I use to memorize the facts about these muscles, the carpi muscles, is as follows. Number one, they only have actions at the wrist joint, and all of them have two actions at the wrist joint that we can easily decipher from their names. So these muscles are not suggested to have any roles in finger extension like some of the other muscles that we'll look at. But instead, that first point, they only act on the wrist. So all the carpi muscles only act on the wrist joint. And the second, that they have two actions which we can decipher from their name. So extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis are clearly going to have the actions of wrist extension and wrist radial deviation. Whereas extensor carpi ulnaris, with ulnaris in its name, is going to be a wrist extensor, but also an ulna deviator. So the carpi muscles only act on the wrist and all have two actions at the wrist that we can decipher just from their name alone. 
So next, we're going to talk about some of the muscles that have more of a role in extension of the fingers as well as the wrist. So, for example, we have extensor digitorum, which is commonly also referred to as extensor digitorum communis. So this muscle also originates from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. And it then runs down the posterior forearm to insert into the distal phalanges of digits two, three, four, and five. And we can see how their tendons across the four digits almost create a little bit of a network with this really interesting structure distally, including a central slip and lateral bands either side of that central slip part of the tendon. As you can imagine, the key role of this muscle, as the name would suggest, is to extend the digits, extensor digitorum. We then have extensor digiti minimi, and we can see how this muscle also originates from the lateral epicondyle. It then runs down the ulna, posteriorly down the forearm, as the fifth digit does, because with the name extensor digiti minimi, we can see here that it inserts into the fifth digit, and it inserts into the fifth digit via the extensor expansion network created by the muscle we've just looked at, extensor digitorum. And we can see how these two muscles blend really nicely in order to extend the fifth digit. Now, a couple of other really important muscles that have more secondary roles at extending the wrist and have more of a role in extension of various digits, and therefore it's important to mention. And these are extensor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, and extensor indices. Once again, all weaker wrist extensors, but they do have a role in extension of the other digits. So, as you can imagine, extensor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis act on the thumb, as the anatomical term pollicis specifically refers to the thumb. And we can see if we tilt this model slightly that extensor pollicis brevis inserts into the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb, and extensor pollicis longus inserts into the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. And then we also have extensor indices, indices referring to the index finger, the second digit, and we can see how this muscle runs from the posterior border of the ulna as well as the interosseous membrane, and then runs down towards the second digit, and it actually inserts into the extensor network created by extensor digitorum that we looked at not long ago in order to specifically provide extra strength in extension of the second digit. So that's the anatomy of those key muscles. Now let's look at different clinical conditions which are really important to consider when we think of them in practice. And the first is going to be tennis elbow, also known as lateral epicondylitis, lateral epicondylopathy, or lateral elbow tendinopathy, to name a few different terms. In this video, we're going to refer to it simply as tennis elbow. So the key muscles that we've looked at that contribute to tennis elbow are as follows. These are extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor digitorum, extensor digiti minimi, and extensor carpi ulnaris. Now, the key thing about all of these different muscles, as you can see, is that they in originate from around the lateral epicondyle. Now, you will naturally look at extensor carpi radialis longus here and say, well, that doesn't necessarily originate from the lateral epicondyle. However, some sources will suggest that it has a form of attachment to this area. Now, the suggestion with all of these muscles is that they originate not as individual strands, but as a common extensor tendon or a common extensor origin, where it's suggested that actually there's one big tendon that covers all of these different muscles to in originate from the lateral epicondyle. Now, it's there suggested that there is an attachment from extensor carpi radialis longus to that common extensor origin. However, be aware that anatomically, extensor carpi radialis longus doesn't necessarily originate from the lateral epicondyle.
Now, the muscle that is suggested to contribute most to tennis elbow is extensor carpi radialis brevis. So do be aware that that one is suggested to be the most irritated when we have tennis elbow. So the idea behind tennis elbow is that it is a tendinopathy of that common extensor origin, where we get overload with overuse of the wrist extensors, particularly with movements such as gripping and twisting that leads to pain around that lateral epicondyle, around the lateral elbow. So the times that we see this most commonly in practice is people who have manual handling based jobs that include lots of gripping and twisting. So therefore, it's most common amongst middle aged men who might have jobs such as builders, plumbers, carpenters, all those who have these repeated gripping and twisting movements. And yes, it can be that the onset is linked to playing too much tennis as well. But the most common time you will see it is with that overload with wrist extension, gripping and twisting in the cohort we mentioned. So you can test for tennis elbow with different tests like these. Here we have Maudsley's test and Cozen's test. Cozen's test involves resisting wrist extension and seeing whether or not this recreates pain at the lateral epicondyle of your patient. And Maudsley's test includes resisted middle finger extension and once again seeing whether or not this recreates pain at the patient's lateral epicondyle where tennis elbow would be. The way that I remember these, M equals M, Maudsley's equals middle, to remember that Maudsley's test is resisted middle finger extension. The other really unique test we can use is a grip strength test. Here our patient holds a handheld dynamometer and we ask them to grip the dynamometer when their elbow is in a 90 degrees flex position and then we ask them to repeat the test with the elbow fully extended. If you find that there is a 5 to 10 percent reduction in their strength when the elbow is extended, this is suggested to be positive for tennis elbow. So we can use these tests to try and see if our patient has this condition. So naturally, the other major assessment tool we have here is palpation around the lateral epicondyle because we can see how all these tendons insert into it. So the areas to palpate might be the lateral epicondyle itself, but also don't forget just distal to this, where the common extensor tendon or common extensor origin is, as we know that that is where the tendon is located and is going to be the irritated factor in tennis elbow. So the other key clinical condition that I wanted to mention here is a radial nerve palsy. So let's talk about the radial nerve. So from the brachial plexus, the radial nerve runs inferiorly underneath the head of humerus, underneath our axilla or our armpit, before it runs down the posterior aspect of the humerus where it innervates the triceps muscle. It then runs to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, the key area that we've been talking about here. And therefore, you can imagine it's going to innervate some of our wrist extensors, which originate from the lateral epicondyle. It then divides at the posterior forearm into two different branches. First of all, the superficial branch of the radial nerve, which contains mainly sensory fibers and runs all the way down towards the wrist, as we can see here. And the second being the deep branch of the radial nerve. And the deep branch of the radial nerve gives rise to a really important nerve, which is the posterior interosseous nerve. Now, the posterior interosseous nerve is so important because it innervates such a large number of the wrist extensors. We can see that the posterior interosseous nerve runs down the posterior aspect of the forearm, posterior to the interosseous membrane of the forearm, which gives it its name. And therefore, we can, of course, remember that all the wrist extensor muscles run down the posterior forearm. And so it makes sense that the posterior interosseous nerve will innervate some of these muscles. So to go through this in more detail, we have the radial nerve and the posterior interosseous nerve as the key branch of the radial nerve. Now, out of the muscles we've looked at, the only two which are innervated by the radial nerve directly around the lateral epicondyle here are extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis. 
The others are all innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve. So we're talking about extensor digitorum, extensor digiti minimi, extensor carpi ulnaris, and so on and so forth. And so it's really important to understand that the posterior interosseous nerve is that key branch of the radial nerve. So how does this matter in clinical practice? Well, one of the key signs of a radial nerve palsy is a wrist drop. This is where your patient walks into the emergency department or walks into your clinic with a limp flexed wrist where they are unable to actively extend the wrist or the fingers. And the reason for that is because they may have a radial nerve palsy, thus shutting off the motor supply from the radial nerve and the posterior interosseous nerve. Now, right at the beginning of this section, we highlighted how the radial nerve runs underneath the axilla. And one of the key ways in which a radial nerve palsy presents is with what is called Saturday night palsy. This is where individuals would drink too much alcohol and would fall asleep at a bar or at a pub with a chair wedged underneath their axilla, falling asleep like so. What this would lead to is compression of the radial nerve in the axilla, leading to compression of that nerve and thus making it unable to function and unable to supply the wrist and finger extensors. So that's the radial nerve palsy, also known as Saturday night palsy, and now you know how it leads to a wrist drop. So everyone, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button and subscribe to the channel for all our best updates. We have loads of other brilliant resources on our Instagram account, at Clinical Physio, so be sure to follow us there. And if you want more on anatomy, check out membership at member.clinicalphysio.com. As a part of membership, if you are a premium or annual member, you will get access to the Wrist and Hand Anatomy Bootcamp. This is a brilliant seven-part series that teaches you all the key anatomy around the wrist of hand, including your bony anatomy, ligaments, other soft tissue, all the key muscles around the wrist and hand, nerve supply, and Blood Supply, a brilliant resource for learning your anatomy. So with that, my name's Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.